how it works. Uh, so thanks for being here. I'm excited that you're um, here at the end of the conference and uh, still eager to learn. That's always a good thing. Um, I've already been introduced, but I'm Kyle Rappenchuk, and I teach here at School of the Ozarks. In fact, this is my classroom, so I'm extra comfortable here. And then um, some of you, how many of you went to Sarah's uh, talk the other day, yesterday, I guess that was? Quite a number of you, so I'll let you introduce yourself. I'm Sarah Osborne, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I'm an adjunct instructor at the college, but I also um, am a passionate advocate for classical schooling. I uh, have homeschooled my kids classically for a few years. Um, I have three who are currently here at Essebo. Um, and I just love being involved in this community. So thanks for letting me be a part of it. <coughs> so Sarah and I are going to talk this morning about cultivating creativity in the classical Christian school. And some of this is just cultivating creativity in our own lives to begin with. But then we also, near the end, want to speak specifically about what might this look like in a school context. How could a classical Christian school buy into the necessity of creativity, the value of creativity, and then begin to make some strides towards actually promoting creativity um, so that it's not only an individual endeavor, though I think that's important, but it also becomes a community endeavor. And so Sarah already mentioned the value of being in this community. I think that's what we ultimately want to uh, recommend to you is that creativity might be a personal thing in some ways, but it needs to be cultivated in community. And so we're actually going to argue for the, the importance of that community to build this. Um, the, the kind of the background for this talk, I guess you could say, um, was, was a book that we both read by Andrew Peterson called Adorning the Dark. And uh, it's a phenomenal book. I recommend that you read it on your own. We'll read some quotes from it today as a way of kind of launching into our discussion. Um, but I came across this book because I had started listening to Andrew Peterson's music. He's, I guess if you could say, primarily a musician, at least that's kind of how he got his start, um, and then also has written a series of children's books um, called The Wingfeather Saga that some of you may be familiar with. And then um, in the midst of that started this Behold the Lamb of God tour, which is a, a really scripturally rich um, Christmas program that they travel around to different places and perform with a number of his musician friends. And so there's a different context, I think, in which a lot of people end up uh, encountering Andrew Peterson. Um, I first learned about Andrew Peterson from my friends Rusty and Sarah Osborne <laughs> and proceeded to ignore um, their pleas for several years to be listening to his music. Um, you know, it's kind of things go. I didn't really have the time, if you will, to figure that out. Um, and so, I, uh, yeah, priorities. I should have, I should have listened to my friends. Um, although, to be honest, you know, sometimes friends lead you astray. In this case, they did not. Um, and so, it was actually really, I'd say, last spring especially, um, when I was just looking for ways, really, in the season that we are now, to prepare for Easter that uh, I encountered, as if they hadn't told me before, his Resurrection Letters, two CDs, and he has a resur Resurrection Letters prologue, which is more of a kind of Lent devotional leading up to Easter. And I began listening to that thing on repeat over and over and over. And uh, I, I think part of the reason I had never really gotten into him is the first song that I heard, um, I just didn't really like his voice that much. Thank you. Yeah, but listen, here's the deal. Then I kept listening to it, and it, it got better and better, and I realized that I was just a fool, and he's fantastic. And so, I'm almost to my fool stage. Yeah, and so anyway, I, I wrote a review of this book, kind of a more personal review, not a formal academic review of this book, on the Classical Thistle in the fall, and I basically, if Andrew Peterson, if you ever read this, I apologize for thinking that about you. Um, but that really launched me into a greater interest in his music, and I began listening to his uh, various albums. And then when I saw this book was coming out last fall, I bought it, came in the mail, and uh, was just in a really busy time of my life, and thought, I don't really think that I should be reading a book for fun, but I needed to read a book for my soul. And I don't know if you've ever reached that point where it was just, I, I'm dry, I'm empty, I need to feed my soul with something. And I sat down on a Friday and I began reading this book 
And I thought, well, I know what I'm going to do tomorrow. And I sat, and it happened to be just this really beautiful day, and I sat down and I read the rest of that book that day. And really just transformed me in a lot of ways, and I may talk about that some as we go on. But this was supposed to be like a two-minute introduction. Okay. So this is what happens when you plan to lead something with someone else, is the first person who gets to talk totally takes it off track. So that's a little bit of my story with Andrew Peterson and why this book became really... Uh, significant to me and so uh, Rusty and Sarah were actually in Amsterdam at the time and so I was like uh, I think I posted the review and you guys responded to that like hey we're gonna be reading that book in the next you know month when we get back so after she read it she said we need to talk about this book and I said yes we do <laughs> so anyway I'm done Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually was introduced to Andrew Peterson uh, literally about 20 years ago. Um, I went to college in East Tennessee, which is his stomping grounds, um, and I still remember sitting in a folding chair in the front of New City Cafe in downtown Knoxville, which was a place that um, someone was trying to give a platform to kind of up-and-coming singer-songwriter, Christian artist, and he sat about five feet in front of me with his guitar, and I listened to some of his first songs. And actually, I too was not a huge fan of the voice at first. It's true. It's true. Uh, however, that it has changed. This has got, gotten stronger over time. Yeah. Um, but the things that I appreciated about Andrew Peterson first, um, I mean, I, I like the singer-songwriter kind of folk style music anyway. Um, so that was a plus. But I just immediately appreciated his honesty, transparency, sincerity, authenticity. Um, he seemed to be chasing after the same things that as a college student I was trying to find. Um, and in many ways, I feel like we've kind of grown up alongside each other. Um, I would never say that to him in person, but, <laughs> you know, I mean, really, yeah. he's just a little bit older than me, but we kind of hit the same life stages at the same time. Um, you know, he would write songs about his marriage, and I could identify those themes in my own life. And then he had children. And then he raised teenagers, and I'm still listening to those songs. <laughs> um, I have stood in my kitchen and cried to some of his songs that just felt so poignant, and I have grieved alongside him. I've gone through seasons of darkness alongside him. Um, just feel like he is one of those voices that long after he's gone, he's still going to be listened to. Um, I will say that the Behold the Lamb of God uh, project has been... Um, one of my family's favorite ways to celebrate the Christmas season. Actually, this last semester when we were overseas, we all crowded onto a couch in a cabin in the Highlands of Scotland and watched the live stream together. Um, it's something we wouldn't miss. I mean, if we do three to five things every holiday season, this is one of them. Um, and I still think, Rusty and I often say, I think that's going to be the thing that lives on. I think that's going to be his legacy, is that project. It's just so beautiful and scriptural, full of truth. It's, it's, he is an artist in the true sense of the word. Um, he's a poet, not just a singer. And he's a writer. Um, he's so many things wrapped up into one. And I think that's why um, his voice on the topic of creating and, and cultivating creativity is worth listening to. Um, so yes, when Kyle <laughs> posted that blog, I thought, ha, he got, he's on it. He, he, he caught the bug and I couldn't wait to talk about it and um, to look for ways to encourage others in the same way that he has encouraged both of us. Yeah. So. So, I think actually I'm supposed to keep talking. Yes, you are. Okay. <laughs> well, I was just waiting for you to take over. Uh, no. Um, okay. Sarah's going to continue talking. Yes, I'm, gonna, I'm now going to continue <laughs> speaking. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have given you a handout with some uh, select quotes from this book, Adorning the Dark. Um, these are, Kyle and I just kind of put our heads together collectively and tried to list some of the things that really stood out to us the most. Uh, about his remarks. Some of them are practically oriented, things that we can do. Some of them are more encouraging, inspirational um, in nature. So we'll hit on several of those. The first one was to just do something. Um, that might seem like something you don't need to read in a book. <laughs> but for me, I think it was. Um, 
I'll read the quote here. He says, you can think and plan and think some more, but none of that is half as important as doing something. However imperfect or incomplete it is, if you wait until the conditions are perfect, you'll never write a thing. Been there. Either you're willing to steward the gift God gave you by stepping into the ring and fighting for it, or you spend your life in training, cashing in excuse after excuse, until there's no time left, no fight left, no song, and no story. Um, I just have to say that, um, <coughs> well, I turn 40 next month, <laughs> and I have four children. Um, our house is busy and full. I teach at the college. I come here every day to help teach my son, who's a, uh, struggling with reading. Um, I'm busy. I still cook most of our weeknight meals. We eat around the table together. I'm constantly thinking about how to cultivate beauty in our home and how to help support my children's learning and how to help support my husband's ministry and how to do all these things. Sometimes I just need someone to tell me, stop cashing in excuse after excuse and do something. Um, I am a wife. I am a mother. I am a teacher. I am a friend, but I'm also me. And I have my own gifts that God has given me. And sometimes I need to be reminded that he has a purpose for those. And that I need to just step into the ring and do it. Um, the next thing is a willingness to fail. I think that goes hand in hand with doing something, right? He says, sometimes you start with nothing and hope it all works out. Not sometimes, every time. All you really have is your willingness to fail coupled with the mountain of evidence that the maker has never left or forsaken you. I'd like to just kind of link that to the next one too, on diligence, patience, endurance. You just keep going to the pond over and over until you catch something worth keeping. So if songwriting is about patience, writing a book is about endurance. As a writer, I chuckled when I read that. Um, but that willingness to fail coupled with the perseverance to keep going, I mean, all of these are tied together. You'll see the same recurring themes. But, um, you know, I think sometimes as adults we stop asking that of ourselves. We ask our young children to be willing to fail as they're learning new concepts. As teacher, as a, a composition teacher, I ask my students to be vulnerable and not be afraid to fail when they're producing writing that they're nervous about. Uh, and somehow, along the way, I think we don't ask that of ourselves anymore. Um, you know, wh why am I suddenly not willing to fail or afraid to produce something that I'm asking my students or my children to do? Uh, I want to model that for them. And sometimes I fear that perhaps I'm guilty of not doing so. Uh, hard work. Being a writer is a lot more like being an architect or a soldier or a nurse than most people realize. It's a craft that you're constantly learning, a craft that's shaped by a bit of talent in submission to a great deal of work. The best thing you can do is to keep your nose to the grindstone, to remember that it takes a lot of work to hone your gift into something useful, and that you have to learn to enjoy the work, especially the parts you don't enjoy. <laughs> I like that. Um, this also goes back to just doing something, right? But to know up front that it is hard work, but um, anything worth doing is worth doing badly, right? We've all heard that. Um, to not be afraid to put in the effort, to schedule the effort, to find time to make the priorities the priorities, um, and to do the hard work. And then to love the listener. Um, dash all pretense, be who you are, kick down the walls, love the listener. It's scary, sure, but good songwriting is a call to courage on both sides of the exchange. And I think we could replace the word songwriting with nearly any creative pursuit, right? Um, it's scary to create anything that someone else is going to hear. It's scary to stand up here and tell you ideas that I don't know how you will respond to. It's scary for me to come up with ways to try to teach my children concepts that I don't know if they're going to grasp. It's scary to, to write a piece and not know how the reader's going to respond. Um, it's just scary. But I think one of the things that motivates us is to think about the reader, the listener, the receiver of whatever it is you're creating. Um, that's what motivates me uh, in much of, of my creative pursuits. And I think it's just important 
I think sometimes when we talk about creativity and we're trying to think of ways we can hone things about us, we forget to think about the listener, the viewer, uh, the receiver of our creative message. And it's our love for that person and our desire to use our gifts to bless other people um, that can really push us on those days of hard, grinding work um, and just doing something. Thanks, Sarah. So the next one we have here is serve the work. And uh, Andrew Peterson has an entire chapter devoted to this idea. And he says, serving the work doesn't mean we don't have an agenda, but that the agenda works in partnership with the wild creative spirit, not as an overlord. Agenda is bad when it usurps the beauty. Christian art should strive for a marriage of the two, just as Christ is described as being full of grace and truth. Truth without beauty can be a weapon. Beauty without truth can be spineless. The two together are like lyric and melody. And I think what really stands out to me, it, it may not come through entirely in this quote, because like I said, it's an entire chapter. But what he means by serving the work is, is the fact that there are times where as you do the hard work of beginning to write, and maybe this is the same with beginning to paint, uh, is that the work can become something else than you really thought it was going to be. And, and I've kind of had that experience in some ways where I, I'm, I'm a perfectionist, uh, I'm the kind of person that likes to logically think my way through things, but I also have this creative side, so it's a very odd blend. And so sometimes I try to do creative work in a logical way, and other times I try to do logical work in a creative way. And I get a little bit mixed up, but it gets a little bit fun at the same time. But I think what I found is that a lot of my writing was this idea that I had to have it all in my head, and I had to have it all worked out before I put anything on paper. And really, in, in talking with my wife over the years, she's like, you're going to stress yourself out. You have so many words in your head. Just put them down on paper. I was like, but it's not perfect yet. She's like, deal with it. And so I, I'm learning to deal with it. I have about 20 journals. This is my organized logical side. Each one is for a different thing. They all look different. They all have different designs or colors or shapes or materials. And I can tell you from the journal what each one is for, so that there's the logical, insane side. Um, but I've begun writing down thoughts. I've begun writing down snippets, writing down quotes, writing down ideas that are not fully formed and returning to those. And it's been freeing. And some of the things that I've ended up writing or communicating in, in talks or sharing with my students are things that I didn't really intend when I first started the process. And I think that's what he's talking about with serving the work, mm -hmm. is that if you'll just step into it boldly and do the hard work, that sometimes it becomes something that you didn't expect. And that's that work of the Holy Spirit working through us while also at the same time bringing our passions, our ideas, our research to the table. Those kind of blend in a unique way. And, and he says they're like lyric and melody. I just think that's a beautiful picture of what can, can come out from that. The next one is friendship and community. It says that's community. They look you in the eye and remind you who you are in Christ. They reiterate your calling when you forget what it is. They step into the garden and help you weed it, help you to grow something beautiful. C.S. Lewis famously said that friendship is born in that moment when one person says to another, You too? I thought I was the only one. <laughs> Remember that it is in the fellowship of saints, of friends and family, that your gift will grow best and will find its best expression. And so uh, this kind of, this story blends a little bit into a couple of different ones here, but several years ago now, I guess about five years ago now, um, I tell this story a little bit in the, the program, but Scott and I were sitting at the ACCS conference having a conversation about a John Mark Reynolds talk that we had just been really fascinated by from, you know, it was Athens and Jerusalem. And we're wrestling with these ideas of classical education. I said, man, Scott, I just, I need to write more. Like, that was one of those things in my PhD that people are like, when you're done with your PhD, you're not going to want to read another book <laughs> for a year. And I said, that's not true. I know that I'm going to keep reading. I said, but what I guarantee I'll stop doing is writing, and I did. I just stopped writing entirely. Like, my pen did not touch a page. I did not type up an essay. I did nothing for a year because I was so burdened from the writing of a dissertation that I didn't want to write anything ever again. And I said, Scott, I need some kind of accountability. And so Scott, for me, was that community 
that that accountability that said, hey, we're going to start a website, and you're the only one writing for it. And so, <laughs> so I hope you start writing. <laughs> All right. And, and for Scott, it was the same thing. He said, I, I want to work on the skill of writing. He said, I was never great at grammar. That wasn't really my thing. Um, but I want to get better at it. I want to be writing. And so for Scott and for me, that was accountability, but it was also community. It, it was somebody that would look at my work um, beyond just myself. And uh, I want to grow that community of people that will give me feedback. I'd rather the first time you read my things, it's not already published on the Classical Thistle. Because if you read it before then, it will be better by the time I finally publish it. Um, and so friendship and community is so great. And I think there really is that place where you go, wow, you too, you, you like that book? Mm -hmm. Right, that was, you know, Sarah and I have been friends for a long time now, but, but connecting over that book, oh, you too, Andrew Peterson. I think <laughs> Rusty and Sarah were so excited when I finally got into Andrew Peterson because it's like somebody else that we can talk to now and knows what we're feeling and thinking and experiencing. Uh, it's so meaningful. And so we'll come back to the idea of community but I wanted to spend a little bit of time there because I think that's the heart of creativity. It is fostered in community. Uh, Sarah wrote a review on the Inklings. We were just talking about this book this morning. Even C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien and Charles Williams and Owen Barfield, these great writers, they needed community mm -hmm. to spur them on. We wouldn't have um, The Lord of the Rings without that kind of creative community. And wouldn't we all be in a worse place without that? <laughs> All right, so steward the gift, and we've already heard this, but this one, uh, I'll tell you in a minute. You can't blame your equipment. You can't blame your lack of time. You can't blame your upbringing. Either you're willing to steward the gift God gave you by stepping into the ring and fighting for it, or you spend your life in training, cashing in excuse after excuse until there's no time left, no fight left, no song, no story. I like to highlight in my books. I like to write some comments in the margin. I don't always write a ton of comments if it's not a super academic book. And so there are only a few things written in this book. One of them is, I needed to hear that. And right next to this one is, I needed to hear that too. <laughs> um, because I think that hit me in a place where I realized, yeah, I'm writing things for the classical thistle. I'm writing <coughs> things for our humanities lectures. I'm writing things for our students. But I think that God has really gifted me um, or called me to do poetry. And it's something that I've written. And to be perfectly honest, in the last several years, the only three poems that I've written were because my pastor basically commissioned me to do it. Hey, will you write a poem for Easter Sunday? Hey, will you write a poem for this sermon series? Hey, will you write a poem for this? And, I, and it's probably one of my favorite things about my pastor is that he's a good enough friend to say, I want to steward this gift in you because you're not doing it yourself. But that's an area that I go, I just... I haven't been faithful in that. I have to steward that gift. Um, I have to cultivate it. I have to get better at it. Um, and so that's one that I read, and I, go, I needed to hear this because I'm, I'm cashing in excuse after excuse to the point where if I just don't do it, that will no longer be a gift that I possess because I just it, I wouldn't have done it. And it, like my languages, <laughs> when you stop studying them, they go away. Um, so that's one that's really hit me. Um, and on a personal level. He says, start the work, then finish the work. If you wait until the conditions are perfect, you'll never write a thing. Uh, that just reminds me of C.S. Lewis and The Weight of Glory. Um, uh, it may not be that essay, maybe one of the <coughs> other ones, but it's in the book where he, he says something very similar. Um, and I just go, it's so true. The conditions are never right. So if I'm waiting for that perfect moment, I'll, I'll do this when things are better. I'm never going to do it. And so this is pretty similar to stewarding the gift. Start it, because you're never going to find the right time to start it. And then he says, being a writer doesn't mean writing, it means finishing. Mm -hmm. And I have some projects that have been halfway done for two years now. And so this summer, perhaps, I'll take his advice and finish. <laughs> At least I've started, right? This is the drawback of my wife's approach of just put it down on paper, because now I've started. <laughs> now you have now I have to commit to finishing. So. Um, there's, there's something that, and then let the Holy Spirit lead, uh, wrench your heart away from all the things you think you need for your supposed financial security, your social status, set fire to your expectations, your rights, and even your dreams. When all that is gone, it will be clear that the only thing you ever really had was this wild and Holy Spirit that whirls about inside you, urging you to follow where his wind blows. 
And so that's why on the other one I had to write, I needed to hear that too, because on page two, he already sucker punched me in the gut. And I wrote, I needed to hear that. And, and that's why I changed my plans for that Saturday, because I read that line and I said, I'm going to be reading this whole book tomorrow. Because it was so true. Um, I was trying to take control of my life. I was trying to determine where God was leading us. And he said, uh, yeah, I'm going to use this guy, Andrew Peterson, who wrote a book, and it's going to speak directly to you. Um, all you really have is the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you, and you better follow where he blows and not where you think you should go. I was like, all right, let's do that. So we bought a house. <laughs> We're going to be in Branson for a while. So, all right, you're up. I just add one comment on that one about the. I'm not supposed to talk about that one, but I'm going to talk about it. Um, on the Holy Spirit, um, as I've been thinking about that quote a lot and was convicted by it as well, I'm reminded that the Holy Spirit doesn't work in my time frame. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Kyle bought a house the next weekend. I'm still waiting to find out what I know. Um, no, really though. I mean, it's. You, you don't get to tell the Holy Spirit what he wants you to do, and you also don't get to say when you get to do it, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a, a faithfulness. It's a posture that we approach all of our lives with, um, but certainly something I think that was good for us to be reminded of. Um, we'd like to take some time now to think about um, all that we've just said and what some of the challenges might be for us, um, some of the obstacles to overcome um, for creativity to flourish in the classical school. Um, we've thought of a few different areas that seem like they would be inhibiting factors for creativity to thrive. Um, the first is the inherent structure of the classical model. Um, one of the things that we love about the classical model is that it is orderly, right? That it's developmentally appropriate, that it's structured, that there's purpose to all the different things that we're doing. But perhaps every <coughs> pro has a con, right? Or our gifts can also become our weaknesses. So I think in this respect, perhaps uh, when, when overdone or overemphasized, that very structure, which is one of our strengths, can actually become one of our greatest weaknesses or a challenge to creativity. Also, uh, within that structure, especially in the early stages of classical education, in the grammar stage, um, the emphasis on mimicry um, might be perceived as an obstacle. Um, I say might be because I don't think it necessitates being an obstacle, uh, but again, if viewed in the wrong light um, and overemphasized, or if we don't lead our students out of that into the next stage of being able to think their way around things and then produce, you know, eventually. Um, perhaps in our younger <coughs> students, we might have to strategize differently with how we promote creativity because we are, in effect, asking them to repeat what we are giving them, which is generally anti-creativity, right? <laughs> um, also, the promotion of uniformity in the classical school. Um, we wear uniforms that all look the same. Um, we walk in line the same way. You know, we, we follow rules and order in a very specific way. There's uniformity is lauded as a positive thing. Um, again, I think there are good reasons why we do all of those things, but it could potentially be an obstacle to really cultivating a spirit of creativity, specifically in the classical school. Um, those things are inherent in our model, not necessarily inherent in our philosophy, but in the practical outworkings of our philosophy on a day-to-day -day basis, these are things that are showing up that could be obstacles for creativity to flourish. At the same time, <clears throat> we think there are some pretty strong assets in classical mm -hmm. Christian education that make this a really good uh, community forum for promoting uh, creative community. One of those is the idea of Christian community. Um, our school, for instance, um, speaks quite openly about the fact that we're a family, and I imagine a lot of other classical Christian schools do the same kind of thing. We have a lot of families, uh, units, but we recognize that we're all coming together with a common purpose, a common idea. 
we're headed in the same direction. Um, the, the opportunities we have for relationship put us into close connection with one another frequently to where we really are an extended family. And so uh, the very task of what we're trying to do in classical Christian education quite often puts us into good, strong Christian community and becomes then a place where we can flourish. If it requires friendship and community to cultivate this gift of creativity, we have it in classical Christian education. So we think that's a huge benefit or asset. Another huge asset is, is a high view of art. Right? We, we look at the arts and we go, these are important. We don't neglect them. Uh, we talk about the importance of truth, goodness, and beauty. Um, we, we want to make sure that things that our students <laughs> gaze upon are beautiful. Uh, I was really uh, convicted a few years ago, just I love uh, you know, experiencing and, and gazing upon beautiful art and listening to great music. And, and I would walk into my classroom, and it was bare walls, beige paint. I don't know what color that is. Whatever. <laughs> it's boring. Um, and I hate the word boring. It's like a curse word in my house, but it's terrible. And so I go, well, I'm bringing my students here to gaze upon truth, goodness, and beauty, and there, there's nothing to look at. And so as best I could in my budget, I couldn't buy the original. <laughs> I've got the School of Athens. Definitely can't buy that original. <laughs> Tearing down buildings. And, and one um, by my guy, uh, Bierstadt, over there from the Hudson River School. Um, that are something that I find to be beautiful uh, as a way of just, you know, introducing that topic. For students, when they turn around and aren't paying attention in class, then I have the beauty of Wrigley Field as well, <laughs> which is a different kind of beauty, and in Cardinals country down here is not always appreciated as it ought to be, but, you know, great art is not always appreciated as it ought to be. Um, but nevertheless, um, classical Christian schools have a high view of art. We, we teach the arts. We, we give opportunities to our students to experience the arts. At least we ought to. I think we do. Um, and so this high view of art, a high view of beauty, is the perfect place to say, let's cultivate some creativity. Let's make beauty. Um, and so uh, I think that's another huge asset of classical Christian education that we bring to the table. We have great Christian community, and we have a high view of the arts. Those are two of the absolute most fundamental things to being creative um, with the gifts that God has given us. And so God as creator creates us to be creative. Let's do that. And I think this is a great community to do that. So despite some of the challenges, and maybe you've got some other challenges that you've thought of, we think this is a great opportunity that the assets that we have, that this is something that we, we could and should cultivate. And so that's really what we're trying to press into then is answering the question, how do we do that? And so we want to move into just some strategies. And so we'll start by listing a few ideas that we've been considering. And then we'll, at that point, open it up to questions, comments, suggestions, and really just an open forum for sharing ideas uh, at that being point. Creative. Being creative. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, and so one of those just goes back to, and I didn't actually plan this, but you won't believe me, making creativity a priority. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I really didn't plan that, but it looks like I did. It just underscores its truth. It does. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to make creative community a priority. It can't be, gosh, I really wish that there was a creative community around here. I really wish that there were some people who would read my writing. I have to make it happen. I have to do the hard work. I don't mind doing the hard work of writing. I do mind doing the hard work of getting other people excited about writing. This is not my thing. I'm not a networker, a connector. Um, that's not me. Uh, I'm a let's have a one-on-one -on -one conversation or let me talk to a whole bunch of people at once. But the whole, hey, do you know this person? Do you know that? That is like, I have to work so hard to do that. And so uh, I, those are excuses for me that I use all the time of why I don't have creative writing community. Um, and so it's something that I go, we have to make this a priority. We need to plan it, and then we need, to, we need to do it. We need to follow through and do it. And so one of the things I'm really pursuing is, how do I get other people involved to, one, hold me accountable, and two, to foster my own growth, and then three, for me to maybe be able to pour into somebody else and their growth in writing poetry, in um, 
Now, reading group maybe might not sound as creative, but the ideas that come out of reading groups, I think, fit. So I have been in reading groups where we've started that. That's been easier for me because I didn't have to initiate it. We had a Chesterton Society for a while. Um, been involved in that. Meet with some students and read through some books together and have cultivated that accountability and growth through that. Um, but I've not yet started the writing community. So this is my open invitation. Maybe this is the forum, maybe you are the people that we start that today and that becomes something we do because one of the great things about modern technology, and I hate most of it, um, is that I can connect with people that don't live next door to me and I can send you my writing and you can send me yours and we can have it back and forth in minutes. Um, and so that, that's an opportunity that we have that I think is something that we could step into. Uh, and the second one is just accountability. Um, you need to have everyone write something for each of those meetings. Um, there's the accountability. I don't want to be the one to show up empty handed. I don't want to be the one to show up having not read. I don't want to be the only one who didn't submit something to our group to then get feedback on. And so the accountability is so helpful. And I already mentioned this was one of the factors for us starting the Classical Thistle was the accountability for Scott and me to be writing, to be thinking about classical education. It wasn't enough to just say, I wish we'd talk about this more. It was, we have to because we're going to be writing about it. And so those are just a couple of, again, we're still a little bit big picture. Um, and, and Sarah's got a couple more big picture wise, and then we're going to dig specifically into some ideas for students, teachers, and parents. So, so um, another strategy for cultivating creative community is space and rest. Um, hopefully, Kyle's talk this morning will help us find ways to make more time for that. Um, I can just say um, anecdotally, personally, um, Last semester, my family was on a sabbatical, which is a big time of space and rest. <laughs> and I recognize that most of, you know, most teachers are not maybe going to have that opportunity. We do have summers, right? Um, we do have some time uh, that we can find time to rest. But the thing that struck me um, about space and rest while we were on sabbatical was how long it took for me to be taken out of all of my normal responsibilities before I had anything to say. <laughs> I remember when we left, I thought, oh, Kyle, I'll send you all these articles about everything. You know, I'll just be, I'm gonna, really going to write. You know, we're going to go and I'm going to write the whole time and I'm going to do these projects. I'm going to set some goals. I didn't write a thing for probably the first two months um, because I just needed space and rest and time to reflect. Um, creativity is born out of reflection and rest. Um, sometimes it's, it's antithetical, right? Because we think we need to do some things to be creative. Um, so in our schools, in our classrooms, as teachers, as parents, as uh, models for our children, what ways can we inject mm -hmm. <laughs> space and rest? Uh, maybe it's setting serious boundaries on our weekend time so that we do actually return to the work week more rested. Um, maybe it is enforcing family dinner time. Maybe it is saying no to more things. Um, maybe it is making yourself go to bed <laughs> and actually sleeping more. Um, these are, are simple solutions. I'm sure there are some more creative, complex ones, but uh, let's make sure we're doing the simple ones before we move on to those, right? Um, but space and rest in all of those spheres in our lives, I think, will help, um, help us as teachers, as parents, and help our students in turn. Uh, and the last strategy is simply to promote art in our schools, in our classrooms, in our homes. Um, I actually just wrote an article for the Classical Thistle a few I don't remember when it was posted, but on fine art for children. And in that article, suggested several different ways to engage fine art with children. Um, fine art, you know, mostly talking about paintings and drawings and sculptures and things like that. But um, also, where can you promote other forms of art? In your classroom, in your instruction, uh, for the projects that you do, the assignments, the way you do assessment, um, how you teach your classes, um, how you encourage the parents. Um, and then as parents, 
as most of us are also in our homes? Um, do you play a variety of music? Do you expose your kids to a lot of different things? Do you try different foods? I mean, creativity is not confined to painting, right? Or writing, even though Kyle and I both like to write. I mean, it's just what we're talking about because it's what we do, but there are no specific confines for creativity to only look like writing or painting. Um, so there are lots of ways that I think we can promote art in our classrooms, in our schools as a whole, in our activities, and in our homes as well. So in, in thinking then more specifically about the classical Christian school, um, kind of wrestled with ideas of, well, we have a few different, we, we have one maybe big community, but we have a few different kinds of people within that community. We've got our students, we've got our teachers, we've got our parents. And what are some things that we could provide to these different groups that then over time can begin to intersect and to create one bigger community of creativity. And so for students, um, we give them assignments all the time. And so it would not be very difficult for us to create within our classes writing groups where we provide some aspect of creative license. It's not, here's the essay question that all of you have to write. There's some freedom within that for creativity. And to put students in consistent writing groups where they give feedback. They learn to be honest and kind. <laughs> I think that's always the fear, is they go, I'm very kind, and so you did a great job, and give no actual critical feedback. Or there's so much on the critical feedback that like now you can't ever give your paper to them again because you're so fearful of what hateful thing they're gonna say. <laughs> and so we, we can begin that. I think first of all, it's hard to teach students to have that vulnerability when we won't give our work to somebody else. <coughs> um, th there have been some times where I've, I've done the assignment I've given to students, mm -hmm. then I'm like, I now have to show them my work. What if they wrote a better paper than I did? <laughs> and then I read theirs and I go, they did write a better paper than I did. <laughs> now I really don't want to show them. So I'm like, well, here's mine. It's the fourth best in the class, in my opinion. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I'm a little bit, you know, weighing on my side here. And so there is something there where, where we can just put them in writing groups and give them some consistency of feedback from each other. Uh, maybe that's something that they want to do outside of school then as well. And, and a teacher can be there to encourage them in that, participate with them in that. Um, I'm looking into more and more creative project options. Uh, is there a way that you don't have to just say, do this one thing, but give them options? Maybe in your history class, that means you do a, a museum project and they're a museum curator and they're going to, uh, to be the one who designs the museum exhibit and goes and explains that to the people who have come up to the exhibit. Oh, what is this I'm looking at in the museum? And explains to them, oh, this is why we got this piece. This is what it is. That's a creative idea that provides a lot of freedom for a student to get excited about history that doesn't involve just an essay. Um, maybe there's a way that they can paint something that's in the historical era that they're doing things. Uh, in literature, maybe they can reproduce their own story in the same genre uh, of things you're studying. If you're studying Shakespeare, maybe they write a sonnet, but on some silly topic that they pull out of a hat. I don't know, but there's some ways that we can put before them creative options for uh, even class assignments, but then things outside of school as well that get them excited about thinking through their own ideas and, and coming up with some of those. So that's just a couple of things for students. For teachers, Part of that is faculty workshops on creative topics. So like this right here, we're sitting here talking about creativity. Uh, maybe this is some kind of, maybe a professional development with your teachers and you can bring in something on creativity in there. Maybe you invite in a, a local published author or musician or somebody who we have, we're near a college campus, <laughs> near, we're on a college campus. <laughs> Right, so we have art teachers here, we have musicians here, we could bring these people over all the time. Um, just on Thursday, we had the opportunity to hear from a choir from Judson University who came and sang to our students, uh, or for our students, uh, in our chapel. And so there, there are opportunities that we have that maybe you don't have, but you probably have people in your community who are doing the kinds of things that you could put before your students. And so there's some things for, for teachers that we could then have those people come and do workshops for us. We can encourage our teachers to produce a creative project of their own and share with the faculty. I guarantee I would be shocked to see the work 
that my faculty uh, colleagues could do. I, I would go, I had no idea you were such a great writer. I didn't know you could sing so well. Holy cow, can you paint? This is amazing. But we don't encourage it of one another, so we don't see it from one another, and so we don't build that community, we don't produce that work. So there's opportunities for us to just encourage teachers to produce that kind of work on their own. And again, then in loving community, share, hey, let me help you steward this gift, let me help you improve this, but I love what you're doing here. And it's good for our souls and it's good for our students to then see what comes out of that for our teachers. And then third, for our parents, um, if we want to partner with our parents in this, this is something that goes maybe outside the school walls and into the homes, but it's something that the school can initiate. So maybe we have seminars for our parents, something like a parents' university, where you bring in that, that person who maybe does a workshop for your faculty, but also does a workshop for your parents. Maybe you encourage them, here's some ways that you can foster this creativity. Um, here's some things you could be doing at home. Uh, encourage them by saying, hey, bring them to, to view and hear and experience great art and then go and I have opportunities for you and so again we maybe have some additional opportunities being on a college campus um, <coughs> but either tonight or tomorrow I'm going to take my children to the college musical they're doing Pirates of Penzance and so if you're in the area and you're not driving home like a long way come on back tonight or tomorrow or Monday night um, and go to the musical and bring your families um, you know, go to an art exhibit. Um, I, I'm more and more this, uh, this last summer we're trying to get our children into great art. And so we, uh, we took them to uh, the Tenny Como Festival Orchestra is what it's called. Um, and, and they gathered people together and they did this beautiful performance. They did Mussorgsky's, I don't think I'm saying that right, uh, pictures at an exhibition. And, and our children were, were exposed to great art. Uh, visual and uh, and hearing it played um, and they were like what are we doing <laughs> because it's not something that we may be cultivated in our children and I go this needs to part be a part of our family life um, in fact I'm gonna tell the joke because I can because I'm talking um, so one of my children who will not be named said why do we have to go to this <laughs> and I said because it's good for your soul and they're like I don't like it I said, you uncultured swine, <laughs> which many of you may know is from Toy Story, where Mr. Potato Head comes up with his face all rearranged, look, it's Picasso, <laughs> I don't get it, you uncultured swine, anyway, okay. so that's now become a phrase in our house, actually, whenever someone doesn't appreciate great art, I just call them uncultured swine, maybe don't ask me to do a parenting workshop. <laughs> Um, but but we, as, we as teachers and schools can communicate with parents and go, hey, there's a great opportunity. This orchestra is coming to town in June, and even though we don't have school, I encourage you to bring your student, right? Bring your child. Uh, hey, we've got the spring musical. You bring your kid to this campus every day, bring them an extra day. Come to the musical. Hey, there's this art exhibit right up there in Springfield. T take your kids to go see it. Hey, two hours away in Fayetteville. There's times when the Broadway musical comes through and go, visit it, experience it. Um, we can communicate that to parents as a school and say, let's encourage them. And if we encourage parents, I think a lot of them will go, I had no idea there was that much around us. Let's go experience it. And when they experience it, um, it can have a transformative experience. I'll, I'll just tell a quick story here. I was just in David Peterson's workshop before this one. He's talking about Macbeth and he said, when he was 15 years old, his parents made him go to this Shakespeare in the Park kind of thing. And he said he whined through the entire thing. He said they brought him back the next year, and he was just like, how can I fall asleep as quickly as possible? And he said he left that performance just in awe, absolute in awe. And he then went on and studied literature and got a PhD in literature and studied Shakespeare. And, like, he's a Shakespeare guy. And all of this from a 15-year-old who whined through the whole first performance and didn't want to go and wanted to sleep through the second one. Like, we might look at students and go, oh, they would hate this, they don't want this, but when they're, when they're if you will, subjected to it, <laughs> forced into it, um, you know, the worst thing that happens is they hear it. <laughs> the best thing that happens is it transforms them and they become a lover of the arts as well. And so, again, 
some parents are super busy. They're just trying to provide for their family. They're trying to get their kids to school. They're trying to help with the homework. They, they're not going to know about these opportunities, and we're in a position where we can communicate that to them. So do uh, you want to add anything to that before we open it up to everyone? Um, just that I think along with what you said about the Shakespeare in the Park story, I mean, so much of, I think, how children, students of all ages, receive what we subject them to um, is in our attitudes, right? I mean, we know that as teachers that our class environment is so shaped by our attitudes about what we're teaching and how we're teaching it. Um, just last week, I remember there was one particular day when I walked into class and I just had nothing. Like, I just was so tired. <laughs> and my kids were all sick and I just wasn't excited. And I mean, class was just, eh, okay. And then the next day I came back to class and I had come up with this new creative activity I was going to try out on them, you know. And I came in with so much more energy and a better attitude and it was great. I mean, they just pick up on it, yes, right? Um, and we know that as parents, too. So don't sell your students short. Um, try feigning excitement. <laughs> if you don't like classical music, it doesn't matter. Act like it's really cool, right? Um, I mean, really. And then learn to like it. Yeah, and then learn to love it. But really, it's like that quote we said earlier, enjoy the work and then enjoy what you don't enjoy, right. Right? right? I mean, that's just part of it. We're all human. We don't all love the same things. But you don't know what that student might learn to love if you model the right attitude for them. So. That's all I have to say. Awesome. <laughs> well, we want to open it up for questions or comments, things maybe that you've tried. So, yeah, please. I have two. The first one, briefly, though, is don't underestimate your ability as a body, um, your, especially a financial position. So, like, I don't have a lot of money, but if I ask my school to make a phone call to the local museum and say, hey, if we got 15 families yes. to buy a membership, would you give us a discount? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, or yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. So that, like, as a whole group, that may be something that could, because then you're bringing in more business for them. That's right. Mm -hmm. But the second thing, I, I read the back of his book, and he talked about, there's a line on there that talks about that this is a handbook for the creep. Can you read the hand, that sentence of handbook? This book is both a memoir of Andrew's journey and a handbook for anyone interested in imitating the way the creator interacts with his creation. Mm. So here's my question, then. The Bible is our handbook how does he use the Bible in his book? How does it all go back to scripture? Yeah, his own personal journey is one of faith, and so it undergirds really everything that he talks about. And so there are times that he quotes explicit scripture, but more than anything, it's how he's been shaped as a follower of Jesus Christ and what that then does for his, um, his faith, his creativity, Really, the, the memoir part of it is that story of kind of redemption leading to creativity. So it undergirds the entirety of the book. Um, he, he doesn't intend for it to be a, let me proof text 50 different things the Bible says about this. Well, there are I mean, books that are out there on that. You use the word like, this is a handbook for you. And I'm like, well, I already have a handbook, so I want you to be a supplemental. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's what I just want to make sure because I haven't read the book. So sure. Yeah, and that's also the publisher saying that. <coughs> so there's sometimes also, they don't get a sorry. choice. <laughs> there's also um, kind of a section in here that talks about like what is good art, like what's Christian art, what's good art, what's good Christian art. <laughs> like, yeah. what? How do we define all of that? You know, as Christians, what do we have to say about creating good art? It's a uh, Madeline Lingle is quoted in there um, for any of you who've read her on that topic. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot about truth and beauty. I think you will find as classical educators that there's a lot in this book that uh, mimics many of the themes that are woven throughout the philosophy of classical education as a whole. I don't think you'll find anything that will contradict that. Yeah. Or the Bible, <laughs> for that matter. Yeah. I have a question for you guys. Um, so you had talked about how we're in a position to share the information with parents. I mean, I love the going to places like that too. But honestly, I don't, I don't know how to find that information. Do you guys have websites that you go to, or how do you find out about these Shakespeare in the Park and these, like, how do you find out about that stuff? Yeah, 
Where is your school located? <laughs> Where is West Plains, okay. Missouri? How far is that from here? Forever. It's two hours and 15 minutes. Well, an immediate resource is the college's community calendar here. Yeah. College's community mm -hmm. calendar. The C of O community yeah. calendar is on the website, and it lists in advance all of the major theatrical productions, art exhibits, yeah. concerts, guest. Okay. You know, I would think Springfield would have something like that. Do you mean yeah. Yeah. they do Shakespeare in the park? Yeah. Yeah. has a community calendar. Yeah. Yeah. That's right, yeah. You got all people getting it. Right. Yeah, so I think what, what Becky's hearing over there is there's a lot of communities that will have community calendars. Um, if you have an institution nearby, a lot of them will have those. They'll invite people in as well as have their own faculty perform. So some of, the, some of the things that I've been to that I've really enjoyed, that Taney Como Festival Orchestra, mm -hmm. is because my wife's good friend, Clara Christian, who teaches music at the college, was in the orchestra. Mm -hmm. So she said, Kristen, why don't you bring your family? We're going to be at Branson High School on this day at this time. And so it was a personal invitation. Um, but I then went back, and I was like, how have I not known of this before? And it's because I was lazy. It was because I was lazy, um, because there's a lot more in Branson because of our, you know, who we, you know, as a tourist town, right? And so I go, oh, there were, there were things that I could have been pursuing. And so it's, it was available on a website. It was available on a community calendar kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the great things of the internet is if something's happening, somebody posted it somewhere and Google will find it. <laughs> also, so. I, if you have any museums nearby at all. We have nothing. Okay. Well, or even Springfield, you know, or we are the I mean, cultural center of our Yes. That's right. Well, <laughs> if you can find a nearby museum for any of the rest of us, um, oftentimes there are art workshops, there are things for children. Goodness, that's something we enjoyed so much last semester when we were traveling is just scouring the museum websites for who's doing which workshop when and how can we go to all of them, you know. Um, a lot of times those will be free of charge when museums or libraries would be another resource yeah. that would put out things about well, workshops. And, and here's, oh, sorry. Well, it's not just, um, not just going to and appreciating, but also being in um, children's theater, yes. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, CYT is real big in our area. We live in uh, near Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and um, it's Christian Youth Theater, and they do some fabulous productions. Yeah. One, so. of, one of our students, though, has started a work of the heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So and it's actually going on today. It's yeah. She's invited students and people from the community mm -hmm. to, to exhibit their art. Good. Mm -hmm. and that's great. That's, that's a great idea. That's what I mean. We're the cultural yeah. 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 So be it, right? Yeah. 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 Be the leader in that. Draw Peter Pan. Yeah. I'm putting Peter Pan and Wendy in April, so we really are trying to be Yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, and one thing, one thing I'll add in, in thinking about your particular circumstance is um, this kind of commitment to creative community is a sacrifice. And so that might mean sacrificing time and money to say, I'm going to take my family on a vacation to a cultural center, and we're going to make plans to hit the museum, hit the Broadway show that's in town, go listen to the local musicians, uh, meet up at this art gallery, like to find those things and to say, we're going to make it a destination. And instead of going to a theme park, which there's nothing wrong with that, uh, or instead of going to the movie theater, we're gonna go and, and explore. And it's gonna be an arts kind of themed vacation. And again, that's a sacrifice because you're saying, we're gonna take the vacation time we have and the money we have set aside for that, or I don't have money for that, so you have to, do without other things for that, and make that make that a, a significant factor. And I say that as one who only in the last two years has gone, I'm starving my children of this, and I need to feed them. Um, I want them to know what true beauty is, and so I have to put it before them. Um, and so I'm going, okay, how do we how do we adjust the budget to make that happen? And we're trying to do that. And so. We're just kind of fledgling creative artists in our <laughs> family. So. We have another comment. I, I just yes. want to, I'm dying to say this. I couldn't help when you were talking about, you know, we make excuses. And I think of everybody in this room probably already knows, but Tolkien's desk was about this big. Yeah. And I think about how sacrifices, but, you know, were time. And he was writing for his children. And this, yeah. what would we do without Lord of the Rings? I mean, yes. really, it, it's transformed our culture so I just think yeah. of that and also the accountability that the Inklings have they were 
constantly bringing each other That's right. and writing and criticizing and saying, I don't like that. And mm -hmm. uh, we have to take those chances. Yeah. Um, <coughs> yeah. Another um, resource that doesn't require any money um, is yeah. the natural world. <laughs> um, take your kids on a hike. Yes. Take your class on a hike. Take the school on a hike. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just, it's not on the Thitzel yet, but there's an article coming. <laughs> yes. Accountability, everyone. <laughs> about going outside. Um, and Lewis and Tolkien. I mean, if you read about them, um, they walked and talked. They yes. were rambling on the countryside. Um, we wouldn't have um, near the creative output that we have if people had not spent time outside. Mm -hmm. And I fear that as you know, the modern age continues, that we yeah. will lose some of that uh, if we don't maintain some intentionality with spending time in the natural world. Mm -hmm. We're going to lose language. We won't know how to describe things. We're going to lose poetry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's a lot of benefit to that, and it's usually free. So. Find a sunny day and go outside. Yeah. Yeah. Can you say something real quick? I thought maybe you could share just super quick. I love what you do because it doesn't matter whether you homeschool, whatever school you do as a parent, what you do with your kids in the summer. I just remember what Sophie did, how you did French and several sure, different things. Sure, yeah. I love that. I'd be happy to. Um, actually, we were just having this conversation at what dinner a few night? nights ago. Um, I, we were sitting down to eat and I said, so, what do you want to learn this summer? Um, we've oftentimes used summer as a time to let our kids just kind of run wild with what they want to learn. Um, I think it's a great time to let them do that. There may be some things that they need to keep up skill practice with just because they need to. Um, but then there are some areas that maybe they're not exploring in school and maybe they can't or you don't have time to let them as a teacher. But I had a daughter that wanted to learn French. I said, let's do it. You know, I have a daughter that's interested in cooking. Um, I'm trying to think of what else we've, um, well, I have one who wants to learn Spanish this year, uh, one who wants to do creative writing. Uh, we've done art, you know, art lessons kind of thing in the summer. Um, but ask your kids, if you're parents, and ask your students, you know, help them have that conversation. Um, nudge their internal monologue on, you know, and help them think about what's something that you could just explore for the sheer joy of it. I mean, you're doing more than just promoting creativity and promoting learning in general. You're also encouraging wonder. Um, you're encouraging inquisitive nature that we want so badly in our students. Um, there's just all, all kinds of joy that comes from that experience for the, for the student, for the child, for the family that gets to kind of come alongside and see what that, that child is learning. Oh, I know. I had a child who was interested in a particular country in Africa. And I thought, okay, that's kind of vague. Uh, but we looked up famous people from that country. We learned, you know, that talked about the language and the culture and the food that they made, you know. And as, as students get older, like, they can self-direct a lot of that. Just send them loose in the library one day with that one goal in mind. But it does help to have a starting point mm -hmm. to say, because oh, obviously, you know, running wild with 20 different subjects is less productive than yes. honing in on a few, yeah. um, even in the long summer days. So. I feel like I remember specifically with Sophie, though, I remember it was like you had a Julia Child's cooking books. So yes, some cookbook, that's right. And there was some art. Uh huh. And yes. There was some so along with the French it was language, like all yeah. This French stuff plus Just, like a little mm -hmm. French. Yeah. Um, she was learning class. French. We were so doing uh, Memoria Press's uh, first first start French or something, um, and you know had the curriculum in place, but then also, <coughs> you know, other things we associate with Frenchness. So yes. that was kind of fun. French toast, and French rabbit. fries. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I, are those not French? We all know food okay. is the most important so, component of culture, right? So. All right. Uh, as we close here, uh, I want to read you uh, a page from this book as kind of an encouragement uh, about the value of, of creativity. And then uh, we'll cut you loose. I'll, I'll be around if you have further questions. Um, and so I'd be happy to answer that. Also, I think 8th A Books maybe has one or two copies of this left. If you run over there, you might be able to get Josh before he leaves and you can get this book. But he says, I want you, dear reader, to remember that one holy way of mending the world is to sing, to write, to paint, to weave new worlds. Because the seed of your feeble yet faithful work fell to the ground, 
died and rose again, what Christ has done through you will call forth praise from lonesome travelers long after your name is forgotten. They will know someone lived and loved here. Whoever they were, they will think they belong to God. It's clear that they believed the stories of Jesus were true, and it gave them a hope that made their lives beautiful in ways that will unfold for ages among millennia that shimmers in the moonlit woods. This is why the enemy wants you to think you have no song to write, no story to tell, no painting to paint. He wants you, he wants to quiet you. So sing. Let the word by which the Creator made you fill your imagination, guide your pen, lead you from note to note until a melody is strung together like a glimmering constellation in the clear sky. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor too by making worlds and works of beauty that blanket the earth like flowers. Let your homesickness keep you always from spiritual slumber. Remember that it is in the fellowship of saints, of friends and family, that your gift will grow best and will find its best expression. And until the kingdom comes in its fullness, bend your will to the joyful, tearful telling of its coming. Write about that. Write about that and never stop. So thanks for coming. Thanks for coming to the conference.